Estamos ahora mismo en el 2017, en un momento en donde ciertas... So, in 2017, we have some very powerful trends. One of them is artificial intelligence, the other one is blockchain, the other one is Internet of Things. And I also would like to talk about uh, neural intelligence. So I would like to start with a phrase from Einstein, who was not only a scientist, but also a philosopher. And he said that intelligence is measured by its rhythm of change. So if this is how you measure intelligence, if we could measure intelligence at this moment, I would say we are in the stratosphere, very high, because it's unprecedented what we see now with regard to intelligence, and in this case, artificial intelligence. So much so that even the president of Russia said this a couple of weeks ago, the nation that is the leader in the field of artificial intelligence will be the nation that governs the world. And this coming from someone who is not such an expert in technology, but popular culture, popular culture the media, etc., have realized that artificial intelligence is something big. Some people don't understand what it is, but anyway, everybody knows that it's very significant, and this is why I'm here today. And a parenthesis that seems not to be related to artificial intelligent, but intelligence. But anyway, I will talk about how empires fall. In 2016, Obama's administration published three reports before Trump, and the conclusion was clear. According to the reports, the U.S. invest in artificial intelligence because this is strategical and urgent at a national level and also from the point of view of military and social development. On the other hand, this year the Chinese government borrowed this report and published it as its development plan for the next generation of artificial intelligence. But this year, Trump decided to cut the budget of the National Science Foundation, which is the branch that takes technology to other agencies in the US to $175 million. And the Chinese government, on its hands, decided to invest $150 billion when Trump on the other hand, is cutting down the budget. So in technology, there is a parallel. The companies that don't adopt these great trends that are related to technology are the ones that eventually die. And a clear example is what happened when the iPhone was invented, and there was BlackBerry and Nokia, which were laughing about this multi-touch phone. But everybody who were really thinking about the matter knew that this was the future. They did not adapt it, and they were left behind and disappeared. And the same thing is happening with artificial intelligence. The companies that are, don't that are not taking advantage of artificial intelligence are the ones that are going to lose a significant share of the market. So today I'm going to talk firstly about AI very briefly, because this presentation is not for technical details. Secondly, what is happening with AI for the future? And finally, which are the titans and the tools for artificial intelligence? They are not so much so titans still, but what are the tools that you can benefit from? What is artificial intelligence? Quickly, I will say that it is nothing else but trying to copy the human mind at a certain level. The final goal is to create general artificial intelligence, that is to say, a being with which I can discuss anything, why the sky is blue, the color of bananas, etc., how I can invest my money. But in the meantime, it has niches, and it's nothing new. For example, this video is from 1978. Terry Williamson, a very well-known scientist, is showing here how to use natural language in order to obtain responses from a virtual world he created.
Well, it seems that we have some kind of interference. So he's saying, take a block bigger than the one you have and put it in a box. Well, I think that this video synthesizes in seven ways what happened with artificial intelligence throughout these years, because the narrator says, even if this software seems to be very intelligent and understand commands, if you asked it something different, for example, what's the color of the sky, it won't even know what you're talking about. And at that time, there were expectations. People thought that they would be able to solve everything in the world with artificial intelligence. But as Nicolas said, there were no algorithms and the IT power to do it. But did this prevent the development of practical applications that had an impact. One of them was the development of expert systems, which took the knowledge of an expert, a specific field, an institution, put it in an inference engine, and based on these interfaces, it would be possible for someone to interact. But amazingly, and this is something I heard not long ago, GeneXus was the first company that did it 30 years ago. And I talked to Nicolas, Gustavo, etc. I said, why didn't you market the fact that you had artificial intelligence? And their answer made a lot of sense. They said, to sum up, if we had seen that we were doing artificial intelligence at the time, we would not have been taken seriously. And that's the reality. So instead of marketing it as artificial intelligence, they said, well, this is a tool that automates the generation of codes and absolutely Extracts the particularities of any specific platform without mentioning the intelligence, because otherwise they would have thought they were crazy. But now the situation has changed. When we talk about artificial intelligence, and that's what generations and researchers are doing at the moment, we're talking about machine learning and deep learning, and also the networks. So I'll tell you what each one of these things is about. So one way of visualizing everything is a graph like this one. Artificial intelligence is everything and the, fin the final goal we want to reach. But then there's machine learning. And inside this, there's deep learning. And everything that is to do with neural learning is something that permeates everything. What are neural networks? Well, a scientist said it, um, it's some model that is based on neurons, and that is what they did. They decided to make a model based on neurons, and then they saw that things worked well, and they created other models from which came machine learning and deep learning. And there's a whole family of patterns that you can look at later in my presentation, if you wish, when you download it. With regard to machine learning, there is a graph that shows very easily what it's about and the approach. Here you see the traditional way of creating a software. What do you do? Well, let's say that you create a software in order to design Gustavo's face. I have an algorithm, and I program something. I don't know how, but I'll do it finally. And then I have an input, which would be Gustavo's face. And the software finally tells me whether this is actually Gustavo's face or not. 
So this is the way in which people have been developing softwares, but with machine learning, I change things somewhat. I start with the input and the output at the same time. In other words, here there are hundreds of photos of Gustavo and hundreds of photos of other people. That's the input. And these ones are Gustavo's photos, and these other ones are not Gustavo's photos, and that is the output. So I give the system of neural networks these two sets of data which have an inferred program or a learned program. The new input is Gustavo's face and on the basis of this software I will know whether it is Gustavo's face or not. So here you have in a graph the old and the new model. And if you want to enter into more details, this is a brief example. Imagine an Excel spreadsheet that has client's information. Let's assume it's a bank. And it also contains millions of transactions. How could a system detect fraud? Well, if I give the system a chart of clients and transactions, and I give also an output of transactions that were actually frauds, and others that were not, the system will create a software that will detect in a new transaction on the basis of past experience whether the transaction is or not a fraud. And that's it. So I hope that with this it becomes less confusing. And deep learning is taking the output and put it into machine learning. That is to say, go from one layer and another layer and layer and another layer, and each one less abstract than the previous one. Let's see that I want to know whether something is a cat or a person. So the first neural network will tell me whether the face has hair or not. The following layer will tell me whether it's facial hair or a beard, and in that case it will say it's a beard, and so on, until the system will tell me this is a cat. And this is how the famous system about detecting cats on the internet was created. So, where do you use machine learning and deep learning? This is a small example about industries because the potential is endless. In sales, for example, you can predict the demand, optimize the supply chain, optimize prices, uh, work on market segmentation, and make specialized recommendations. And on the basis of the system and the past activities, you can predict something for the future. That's what Amazon does when they recommend a product that is similar to what you have previously bought. And for marketing, you can personalize the publicity, the ads, and also you can detect fashions and create personalized garments. And Amazon is personalizing the trends on the basis of what has been chosen. And also, they have artificial intelligence that designs fashion. And it is expected that the new fashions will be bought by a person that has bought such and such a thing in the past. In health, diagnosis and alerts, prevent uh, or predict risks, fraud detection, and then in telecom, uh, preventive maintenance, data analysis. For example, what happens to all of us? on and on, that, for example, uh, your, your Wi-Fi at home is not working and you have to call someone, or inversely, they have to give maintenance to the city for one hour, and then after this maintenance, you still don't have Wi-Fi. So on the basis of the consumption pattern, pattern would, would be the input. Maybe these people could detect whether you are at home or not. And on this basis, they will say, well, the client is not at home at each at such a time in the day because the consumption is very low and then we don't need to give him service at that time. So in finance, it would be, for example, for detection and then a product that is specific for banks, uh, high range. 
banks receive lots of payments, for example, by post or by other means. And sometimes the banks don't know what these payments are for. So on the basis of the numbers, the timing of the check, the signature, the clients would, uh, the banks would be able to detect which client this check has come from. So with regard to artificial intelligence nowadays, here I wrote examples to inspire your next $1 million idea. And let's start with something simple, games, for example. You all know that artificial intelligence of IBM Deep Blue um, defeated Gary, uh, who was the master of chess worldwide. Then in 97 and in 2010, uh, uh, I talked about this, IBM Watson defeated the two world champions. Last year, during a game whose possibilities were larger than the atoms, it was called Go in Asia, very popular, Google defeated the world champion. And this year in Carnegie Mellon University, they created an artificial intelligence that defeated the best poker players in the world. That was incredible because poker you would not associate to something automated because there's bluffing, uh, it involves emotions and feelings. And that experience that Google and in this case IBM obtained was put into practice and they are challenging Watson in hospitals to diagnose diseases and they are challenging developers like us. Another interesting thing, IBM Watson today is the number one expert worldwide to diagnose medical images. One, with one example, they can detect schizophrenia in 74% of activities compared to human beings, and this um, generates um, fMRI. CNN, which has nothing to do with the broadcaster, it's a convolutional neural network. It already exceeds the capacity of human beings to detect medical images. And this can be used in a system that was announced a few months ago. The University of Bari in Italy can detect Alzheimer's 10 years before the symptoms are evident, which is something extraordinary. So how can they know? that in 10 years' time, I will suffer from Alzheimer. It's not that they look into the future. They work on a database comparing patients that had developed Alzheimer. They used the images, and this was fed into the uh, CNN, and they got the results. Something else. We all know Amazon. You know what Walmart is the large retailer in the US. As you know, Amazon is eating the candy of Walmart because people prefer to buy online rather than go to the shop. So Walmart says, we are staying behind. So a few months ago, they announced a partnership with NVIDIA to create a new cloud platform in artificial intelligence to catch up with Amazon. The only problem is that Amazon is also using AI. So well, let's see what happens. Coca-Cola launched a product called Cherry Sprite. The interesting thing is that this product was not suggested by a marketing manager or by a focus group, but by an artificial intelligence that noted that many of the machines they sold, people would buy both drinks and combine them. So why is it that people combine this and they are selling this new product, which is a combination and it's quite a success? In astronomy, in the Slack organization, a group of scientists decided, without knowing what would happen, decided to put a neuronal network to analyze astronomical images of gravitational lenses. They checked this, but with deep learning, 10 
million times faster than with any other technique available so far. So there are many scientific papers talking about the wonders of this in science. Rolls-Royce and Birkeland announced that they will have a new fleet of autonomous vessels on the oceans. Panasonic also announced a few weeks ago, and notice that this is all very recent. Every day we find this type of news. They announced that a machine will wash, dry, and fold your clothes. Imagine how difficult it is to fold the clothes after you wash and dry them. In addition, Oxford University and Google launched a product that reads lips uh, from a distance. And it's much more effective than looking at experts. And this is a joke for those who know. Remember that film, um, 2001, Space Odyssey? The computer would read your lips. In addition, um, spy agencies like CIA are using deep um, learning to uh, detect uh, anneal in a haystack. Maybe by uh, after 9-11, we knew about people and what they were doing. But there are so many cues and so many things to really take into account that they need to use deep learning techniques to find the suspects. CIA says that public projects um, include also artificial intelligence. Many of these projects connect to social media like Facebook, Instagram, to know who's connected to who else and what they are doing. Apple announced that they can recognize Chinese characters and they use core machine learning. They learn and they understand what you write in Chinese. The Autobots, these are autonomous vehicles there's not one single company in the market that is not using some sort of deep learning. And this I added because of a business model. It's called Deep Science AI. What do they do? If you have a small uh, shop or corner shop, very small, they say, we'll sell you a camera. You install it in a corner and we'll charge you two dollars a day to detect and warn you if there are potential uh, robbers in the area. How do they know that? Again, they took hundreds of hours recorded and in artificial intelligence understood the patterns of people who are planning a holdup. That's something we need to think about the future how to make money with my system. And then chatbots and client customer service. As Nicolas said, um, and Rudy said, uh, look at Rudy and Clarita, how they generated what you have. In your GeneXus apps, you will be able to generate automatic chatbots. Another interesting thing, in Australia, you are told not to go to any beach because there are sharks. But today, there are human beings looking to protect you. But a company in Australia created a drone with AI that can detect the patterns of sharks as they swim in the ocean. And now, they are 90% um, accurate. Disney and NVIDIA are working on a project which is interesting, but I'll skip it. There's so many. There's so many things. Disney and NVIDIA uh, joined to create scenes in films. They will bring the audience with and cameras to observe how you react. 
so they know whether the scenes create fear or boredom or enjoyment. And this creates a vicious circle, and they will ask, uh, help them change the actors until the scenes become more effective. South Korea can detect anthrax in cases of bioterrorism in less than one second with a 96% accuracy. YouTube and ML can detect videos with terrorist content and they are removed automatically from YouTube. A Nurable company uh, attended the number one event in the world, Seagraph, and they announced a system where you use reality lenses and uh, they do a scanning of your brain. It's not invasive, it's outside your brain. And with machine learning, the neuronal networks identify when you want to do something. I read a report um, of someone who used those glasses and he saw an object in the virtual world and he said, I want to catch, I want to grab this. And as I thought about it, the object came to me and I was frightened. Imagine the type of interfaces we could create in the future with augmented reality. Like, uh, I said, I want the door to open so I can go to the restroom, or I want to go to a next event by Genexus, or I can anticipate. Then uh, virtual assistants, Siri, Google, etc. I'm not going to go into detail here. And there's a chatbot and virtual assistant that I'm going to mention because it's curious. It's called do not pay. It's a bot trained as AI. These are specialized lawyers who specialize in parking fines. They know all that has to do with law and regulation. And in the last two years, that bot has helped people not to pay 375,000 fines. That's a very successful lawyer, and it's free of charge, so check it. It works in New York, in England, and some other cities in the US. This is another example of how this company, Pixamayor, um, used a tool um, to fight the competitor in the market. The um, video goes very fast. This lady here. The picture was taken from inside the vehicle. With that deep learning tool that understood the scene, you can mark what part you can substitute to improve the image. Look what happens. Incredible, right? You have a beautiful um, changed picture. This is also AI. The six squares were painted by artificial intelligence. No human intervention, not even algorithms. How does it work? This may give you ideas for other systems. These are two AI systems working together. One of them was trained to become an art critic, providing it uh, 80,000 images considered art. On the other hand, the other AI was told, paint whatever you want. It started painting. And the art critic would say, that's not art. That's not art. This is art. That is not art. So it improved, improved, improved until we got to this level. The paintings are being exhibited in Europe today. One day, artists will be out of jobs. This other uh, is called Vincent. It understands the technique of different artists so that we can compete with AI previously shown. We'll see how it works. This is the introduction. This is a prototype so far. And I want you to look at what comes next in 10 seconds. Now, imagine I draw this. 
See what the system generates, this. Or I draw this. And this is what the system generates. So, Nicolas, you can draw something and become an artist. Do you get my point? And what you see here is the first compound disk created with AI. It's called Amper Music, and it's open source. I'll show you 30 seconds. And right before that part, Skynet comes and kills everything. Well, this is the song that Skynet has to announce, to say, well, here I am. And what you see here is an application for video games. What happens in video games nowadays? Why are they more and more realistic? Because there are animators that have to sit for hours to determine how a person is going to walk, or else you hire a team that wears something and detects a movement. But for each new situation, it is necessary to jump an obstacle, for example, and once again, it's necessary to call the animators and spend money so that they draw a picture of someone who is jumping. But now the system has automatically learned what a human being would do under certain circumstances, and this is the result. The black arrows in the prototype is telling someone how and where he should walk, and you see that the movement looks very natural. And now you will see how he learns to bend when he has an obstacle on top of him. That's the idea. That's the idea I wanted you to understand. And for the ladies, you're going to like this. This is a company that for six years wrote down and took note of 120 images of hair, saying, well, this is Afro look, this is gray hair, uh, this is well, different kinds of, share of hair styles, and they drew up an app which I have here. And now it's, uh, it's for iPhone, iOS 11, and this is live. You don't need to record a video. The effect can be seen immediately. Likewise, the same company built this different system, how to put on makeup on someone. This is a system that they created. Isn't it interesting? And what you see here, for those who like football, I was a goalkeeper in New York I, when I was playing football, is a technology that has created a virtual camera that can be put anywhere in the football field without having to take the camera, camera physically uh, to the place. And this was something that Canon from Japan Looked, uh, showed about one month ago. So in the next World Cup, hopefully, it will be able to function in the field and run with the player, for example.
And if you wonder how can they do it if the camera is not there, well, around the stadium they put dozens of cameras and in the past they have learned the, how to take the pictures from various angles and they can identify the ball, the field and the player and they can synthesize everything in real time. And this is something I recorded myself in an office where I was working since iOS 11. I downloaded uh, uh, the video from IKEA and the chair is not actually there, it's virtual because with an artificial intelligence system which recognized the light and uh, the floor, for example, the, it was I was able to create this, which happens in real time. This is how it moved. It would seem that the chair is actually there. And you can download it right now. You can try it, those who have an iPhone above six version. And think of the implication this has in business. IKEA, for example, can do something like this. I recorded uh, this image in an apartment, and the piece of furniture which is not there is affected by the light, for example. So look at the video first. Watch the video. This is something that I recorded myself with my iPhone. Now, before you go to a store and buy a piece of furniture, you download the app and at home you can see how the furniture will look at your own place. And this means money. Who is going to sell more, IKEA or someone who does not have this feature? And this is a vehicle that you can try before you buy it, even in your living room. The girl is not included. For me, this was amazing. And the, you can download the application in Porsche's site. So before continuing on with the second part, my challenge to you is this evening or next week, sit down and think, based on what you are doing or not doing today, how can you use this kind of artificial intelligence system in order to give something possible, positive to your clients, not only solving their problems like fraud, but also uh, telling them what they can do new. For example, offering something like this to a company that sells pieces of furniture. So before I continue, I want to design a couple of uh, things that are matters of concern for me. We can do good and bad things too with artificial intelligence. And uh, it is possible today to write reviews of products that are uploaded, for example, in Amazon in order to change the perception of a product or malware, for example. This company is an investigation company which used a group of human beings and also artificial intelligence in order to create tweeters and see which one was more clicked, and it was artificial intelligence that won. So let's say that you have uh, people working in a call center, and now you can download a software and have a group of 50,000 robots that are creating spam or similar things, and that is a matter of concern. Or imagine a virus that goes into your computer and see how you use it, and they will know that at night you check your bank accounts. So they can go to your computer and see what you are doing at your bank. And there's nothing in your computer that will tell you that they've been there seeing what you've been doing with your bank account. Or other hackers, for example, that experience uh, with human bodies, for example, there are scientists that are playing with 
stimu magnetic stimulators that modify your DNA and get into your brain and can affect the neurons that affect your functions. And with a magnetic field, these nanoparticles that, in, that are in your neurons can heat or reheat, and they therefore can execute involuntary movements. This was done and tested with animals. So let's say that you go to a bar in the future and someone gives you a pair of glasses uh, or a cap, and you may be, for example, uh, standing at the border of, uh, at the shore of a river, and then they trigger this movement and you jump into the river. What will happen, for example, with insurance companies or medical insurance companies when they start investigating uh, information that concerns us and extracting patterns, they may say, well, such and such percentage of the population can suffer uh, from a cancer in the future and the coverage is going to be increased. They can tell you, you have 25 percent chances of getting cancer. And therefore, I'm not going to cover you. All coverage will be $2 million for you. And this is also a concern. Our privacy, for example, and I will give you here a very concrete example. Imagine that a system detects your sexual orientation and can make it public. Stanford University this year, for example, trained a deep learning system with 30 thousand photos that were of people who were gay or not said by themselves and from then on the system was possible to detect on a, with a 91 percent efficacy the possibility to take i was saying whether a man or a woman were gay or lesbian imagine if you can do this with human being, and this is also a concern. And also uh, the film Minority Report, uh, based on the novel of the same name, in the future we could know who is a potential criminal, and we are going to observe these people all the time. And this is something that is already happening in China. Uh, in China there are 170 six million cameras that are watching everything. And these two companies detect the activities of high-risk individuals. Or else, what if I had a digital assistant and somehow I said, for example, hey Siri, buy a ticket for me to Miami and they had a system that can change what I say, and I wouldn't know it, but Siri would use the code of a hacker that would get a commission every time I buy a flight. And Houdini is a system that injects sounds that you cannot hear, but your cell does, and it changes your instructions. And what you see here is a video which is worth one million words. And what can be done in Washington is terrifying. That can synthesize someone on the right hand side, President Obama, and make this person say things that were never said. They go to a database of Obama's videos and they combine the words and the sounds, and you will see how it works. Imagine the potential to create 
propaganda or say, look what such and such a person said. And people who are not very critical or don't do research will believe all this is true. So to end this session, I will see that artificial intelligence will be, will be doing uh, as good or as evil as the data that we introduce in it. So it's a knife. You can, uh, like a knife, you can do something good and something bad with it. So for the future, where is artificial intelligence going? Firstly, this is something that was a curious data for me. Look at the semantic bank. Chris Skinner came up with the idea that my bank in the future has to be the bank that does something for me. Like a digital center, the bank is telling me, you are missing this investment opportunity because I see what is going on in the market, and that's why you should invest. Or the bank is telling me you shouldn't go here, or you should go to uh, another place because you are wasting your, matter, your money. MIT also is investigating the way of putting data together, not only images and sounds, but combining all this information so that they become much more intelligent and efficient in what they are doing, like us human beings. And IBM has the DeepMic uh, program from where Watson came that is called neurogenesis in order to create artificial intelligence with neurons that may be destroyed or reconnected. If I don't use them, they will be destroyed. And this will improve the work of new generations that use artificial intelligence. And the most advanced technology in the world in order to edit human genes is called CRISPR. It's becoming stronger, and imagine, I imagine a future when I can say, for example, I don't want my baby to be born with a propensity to uh, cancer, for example, or maybe I want to change my hair, or I want to, stray, to feel stronger, or to mend my heart, etc. And then another thing is neuromarketing. We are talking about companies similar to the ones I showed a moment ago that watch human behavior in order to market products and services better. In Hollywood, for example, many studios are investing a lot in technologies that are analyzing thousands of hours of dead actors with the idea of bringing them back to life. Because like the little cartoon I showed that walked, nothing prevents Hollywood from analyzing the features of some actors. So digital actors will become very important in the future. And this is all linked to decoding better the human brain and the human mind, which will improve the algorithms that we have created. So this is a whole circle that will be working in the future. This university created a term called Brainternet, which I have translated into Spanish also for myself. And they have created a device uh, that is working remotely and that is telling something to a person, like turn on the light or buy a ticket. And this will have repercussions for the future. DARPA was the US entity that created the internet, one of the engines behind it, world innovation. They created a program, the Euro Engineering System Design. What were program? Wetware, it's not software or hardware, it's wetware. It has to do with the human brain. They are funding six groups that compete among themselves. The goal of the program is to develop a system that can be installed in the brain and communicate the brain with the digital world, similar to the journalist who wore the virtual reality lenses so, to ask for an object. 
One of the news that most impacted me is the one from Carnegie Mellon University. They created a deep learning system. They looked at the brain patterns and they anticipate complex or compound thoughts. Uh, the computer can not only detect that you're thinking about oranges or cars, you may be thinking about an orange car in a technology event. If you combine two different types of things, people, places, colors, the system was 90% efficient in detecting what the volunteers were thinking about. So imagine the future interfaces. You not only say things, you think things, and they happen. And I will show you a video I shared with you three or four years ago. It's visual. It's visual. This was Berkeley University in 2011. They were able to put these devices in the brains of three volunteers to know if they could record what they were imagining or seeing. All the green squares are the people connect, whose brains are connected to uh, this device. In blue, the training data. Don't look at the blue. So when I put the play, compare the red one. This is what the computer decoded from their brains and put in the green squares. It's not perfect, but it's incredible, nevertheless. In the future, you can go to bed, put the device, and then you see what you dreamt with. Or if the wife comes late and say, where were you this morning? And she doesn't know. Uh, so use this device. I'll find out. It's incredible. This was five years ago. Who knows what things are like today? Uh, so three predictions. The first one, the monopoly of creativity will not be exclusive to human beings, to humans 1.0. That's my first prediction. Second, we will integrate AI directly to our senses, and we will become humans 2.0. We will detect brain areas. We will anticipate things. And thirdly, I'm not going into details. Come to my lecture tomorrow. I'll talk about how to visit other stars. Well, we will merge with the AIs and become humans 3.0. So who are the not so much titans of AI and their tools? This has not been defined. There are large organizations like Amazon and SAP and Google, IBM. But the market is relatively virgin, and many things may happen. Having said so, what's happening in terms of tools? Google, Terms and Flow, Launchpad, Intel with a big DL, IBM with Watson, SAP. And I'll make a comment here. If I were to give an award like Miss Universe or a special medal, I would give it to SAP Leonardo because I don't know how they made it, but out of the blue, overnight, they became a uh, powerhouse in space because to create a simple platform, easy to understand, they integrated blockchain, machine learning, big data, and all those things. So that's good. And I learned that Genexus is working with them as well. Then Amazon has many tools. There are many names you can read. Uh, Salesforce has Einstein. Microsoft has um, an array of products that are very good. Apple has Core ML, which means core machine learning. And let me say that it's like the PDF of machine learning. It's a container or a standard or API that allows people 
because Amazon and Apple are creating a container that is standardized, which, that uses Core ML for learning models. Uh, so it's very important. We don't need to have 50 different uh, models to learn from. And this is a list. If you uh, download my presentation, you will have the explanation to know what this is about. These are two screens. In terms of hardware, machine learning and deep learning uh, are computing demanding especially in terms of learning and making inferences. So it's the same uh, as we had with Bitcoin. Then somebody said, oh, we could use GPUs because the graph card has many opportunities. Or why not having a program uh, chip and insert the logic? And the last thing they're doing is start from scratch and design the algorithm. This is what machine learning and deep learning are using. NVIDIA started with GPUs. Google created its own uh, tensor processing unit. And by the way, I read a release, a recent release, that says that both Google and Microsoft, uh, industry is pushing them to move into hardware. Um, field due to AI. If they want to remain competitive in the cloud, if they want to do that quickly, they will have to implement their solutions in hardware. Microsoft has its brainwave. Apple neural engine with a new chip, A11 Bionic. Um, it, it accelerates all that. And a real anecdote. My passport expired recently. I had to come here and I was going crazy because of the storms and the hurricanes and uh, the passport office was uh, not uh, responding. They have a specific telephone number and I couldn't find that number. But I knew that once I went to the States, I had a picture of my passport. So I did the following. Oh, I don't have it now. Well, I don't have it here. Well, I, I, I went to Siri and said, look for my passport pictures. In less than two seconds, I had the pictures. And then I used that. Because with iOS 11, they implemented that Siri understands the context of the photograph, uh, if it's a, whatever it is. So if you have pictures, you can solve situations. That was great, cool, very cool. In terms of developers, if you want to try, these are other Intel products. And I was interested because Intel announced that they are developing the neuromorphic self-learning chip. According to them, the lab tests show that this is a million times faster than current software and hardware techniques. It emulates 130,000 neurons and so on. And another advancement is the photonic chips that record memories and work at the light speed. So where are we heading to? The future of software development and AI. One of the first things that we'll see is descriptive applications with bots. Remember Gustavo's example of generating interfaces in his keynote speech? Uh, uh, Gaston, I think it was. In the future, I can tell the customer, uh, you are in charge of payroll, and I will give you a screen, and you tell me if that is what you want. Or I could send you a bot that chats with a person that says, well, in this screen, would you like to include taxes? And you say, yes. What sort of taxes? Well, this sort. And you talk with the bots to create the application. Bots for QA. Uh, can do software tests, you don't pay someone, they can test it. Then uh, digital assistants that communicate among themselves to create a knowledge chain, as I call it. Today, Amazon and Microsoft did a test that will become public. And you will say, Alexa, 
Open the portal. I want to talk to this or that, to my assistant. Assistants and APIs, local APIs, local to your cell phone or to your machine or navigator, will be more and more powerful. This is what Apple is doing. And then we'll have a very high dependency on the cloud intelligence. The cloud will be more critical than ever to provide hardware and potential and algorithms for the cloud. The programming languages will be less and less important. Why? Because we will be depending on higher levels where we talk to a bot or visually describe what we want to do, and the bot will do it. So finally, detection of patterns to detect uh, software automatically. And if this coincides with Genexus, it's just coincidence. Finally, I will share what happened to me on September 15. I read an article that was called Chatbots with Machine Learning to Build uh, Conversational Agents. And I said, the average person that wants to generate a bot needs to do something to learn about the world of bots. And I started reading the article, and I found the following, this image. And I said, oh, OK, nice graph. I don't understand what it means. Later on, I found this, which explains how the bot works. And I said, mm, OK, uh, I don't understand. Further on, to clarify, I found something that makes sense, this. So I said, now this article will be shared with the audience today. Why? Why should I become a scientist? The only thing I want is to be an engineer providing solutions to the customers. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a salesperson. I don't want to be a scientist. That's a different field. And this is what the industry is demand demanding for us. So I say, why not Genexus, which is better? Quick round of applause. And I'm serious. Why should I worry about the platforms in the future? Samsung, who knows what they do? What's going to be the platform? Why should I worry about details? I only should worry about making money and solutions to customers, not how to do it. That's Genex's job. So let me finish by uh, quoting Gary Dickerson, the CEO of Applied Materials. He said about two weeks ago, I'll read it and I will repeat it. The war will be waged for leadership in AI and that will be the biggest war ever waged in our times. Are you ready to be part of that battle? That's why we are here. So if you want to down download my presentation, it's available. Thank you for coming.